24 bird conservation areas and they're all across the state and they focus on areas that have high quality and high amounts of habitat for birds in different ecosystems. So we have prairie focused ones, we have wetland focused areas, we have forest focused areas. Um, and so these areas are um, roughly 10,000 acres that we've said this is an important area for birds and we're going to, f to continue to conserve these areas for birds. We do a lot of monitoring and research for all these species. Um, one of our programs is focused on actually just monitoring as many species as we can and figuring out what we have in the state and how their populations are doing. So we have over 400 bird species that you can find in Iowa and about 200 of those nest in Iowa. It's important for us to do this monitoring so that we can get a benchmark for how the populations are doing. So if we see fluctuations in, in the numbers of birds that we're getting, or if we see changes in the timing of when those birds are coming, that always affects how we uh, plan our conservation efforts. If we are looking to um, support and foster savanna systems, we may need to do some burning or some tree thinning to make sure that that open savanna habitat main is maintained. So it's all about the um, habitat goal that we're looking for and using the different tools that we have, um, like burning and planting and, and tree cutting and clearing um, in a way to create a system that is native and supports the, the species that we're focusing on in that particular area. I was interested as a kid. Of course, I grew up hunting, grew up in small town Iowa. But then when I moved away from home, it couldn't go hunting on the family farm anymore kind of thing. So bird watching became my alternative uh, for hunting. And I discovered you could go all year round and go you know, about anywhere. And so I, that's when I really got interested in it. The Iowa Ornithologist Union, and an ornithologist sounds kind of scientific -y, but all levels of birders are welcome to join. It's a statewide organization. We have around 450 members, and we have a, a publication, the Iowa Bird Life, that comes out four times a year and lists the bird site, good bird sightings and kind of a data compilation of what folks are reporting. Um, we have a, web, a website that's a, it's a nice website, iowabirds.org, and uh, People post their sightings. There's what we call, <clears throat> excuse me, call a list serve, where people can look at what other folks are seeing at any given time, and report their own sightings or ask questions or anything. We have a Facebook page. We have Twitter. We're really up to date with it. Um, I'm personally not a photographer, but a lot of birders are. A couple of years ago, we started feeding the birds in the backyard. And then the feeding led to taking the pictures, so I dug the camera back out of the closet and started getting busy with it. The first place um, I joined was the Iowa Ornithologists Union, which I think is based here in Des Moines area. They were very helpful in some early bird identifications for me, because like I said, I've only been doing this about a year and a half. And from there, um, the Cornell Lab that does eBird also has a number of other mobile applications for the phones and that sort of thing. Um, I post pretty much all of my sightings to eBird. Um, I do Iowa Through the Lens Facebook group. I do Iowa Bird Photography Facebook group. Um, there's an Iowa Raptor Facebook group. There's an Iowa Critters Facebook group and I post to, to all of those depending upon the pictures I've taken. Well, I've been birding since I was like one or two. <laughs> birds have always just been an interest of mine. Um, and so I grew up kind of being interested in what birds are around me, going to parks with my mom and dad, um, getting outside a lot, and uh, just kind of stuck with it and got interested in ornithology and biology in college and kept going. I got involved with the Iowa Birding Facebook group uh, I think pretty early in its inception, my friend Danny Akers, who founded it, um, invited me to be a moderator and I uh, started to do that and, um, you know, it just kind of took off. So when the group was pretty small is when I got, I got started with it. Um, and so we've gone from, I think zero, you know, just a few of us in 2015 to something like 7,000 members now. The Facebook group basically serves as a, um, a point for anybody to report on birds they've seen in Iowa. 
um, so that other people maybe have a chance to see them or just share that sighting with them. Um, you know, we, we might hope that it's rarer birds in some ways that so that somebody who's really interested in bird watching could um, try to see that same bird. But we have probably most of our members are folks who have barely done any bird watching before and are just setting out a feeder or maybe finding themselves trapped inside because of the pandemic and are just starting to notice the birds around and want to know what a new bird is that they've never seen before. And they snap a very, you know, rough iPhone picture and post it to us and we can be there to tell them what that bird is and what resources they can use to identify it in the future whether it's bird book recommendations or app recommendations for bird ID um, or even just you know if that's all they want is to just know the name we you know folks and it's a whole community so it's anybody who knows chimes in and says I think it's this and they you know then they know what it is. We started probably 12 years ago with one hummingbird feeder on our deck here. I put it out and we got one hummingbird to come to it uh, a few times. I got a few pictures and I was hooked. And ever since then we worked pretty hard at, because I want to attract them naturally as opposed, I mean the supplemental feeding of them is a good thing for them, especially when they're in their migration route, but uh, I enjoy watching them come to the natural flowers that we've planted. There has been an explosion of uh, wildlife or interest in wildlife photography. I mean, when I started doing this quite a bit 10, 11 years ago, I could go to Sailorville and watch the eagles and there might be three hours and I would be there completely by myself. And in the last four to five years, during eagle season, it's nothing to have the parking lot. Fairly full down there with people photographing the eagles. I really enjoy looking at other people's, you know, what, what they see. I mean, there are some, there are some really good photographers on, on those sites. I mean, much better than me. Uh, but for me, it's not so much about it's all about trying to pass the experience. If I see something, especially if I can get a, a shot of, you know, the birds interacting together. I mean, raptors fighting or uh, mating display from one of my hummingbirds. I mean, those become challenges then to try to, to try to catch that. And I like to pass that along to people who might not normally really ever see or maybe ever notice you know what's going on around them. So there's a lot of groups in Iowa that focus on birding or bird conservation. Um, so some things like the Iowa Ornithologist Union, um, Iowa Audubon, and then Audubon chapters and bird clubs throughout the state. Um, there's a group called Iowa Young Birders which is focused on encouraging young people and children to bird with their families. They also have really great information online uh, there's information about sightings on eBird, um, where people can post their sightings and record the, either put photos or just counts of what they're seeing when they're out. Um, and then you can also look for hot spots of birding. So um, there's locations where people go birding a lot and there's maps and things that, and interactive tools there that you can, you can learn things from that. And then they're all about birds.org um, is basically an online field guide with natural history information, range maps, um, photos of all the birds, sounds of all the birds. And then of course the Audubon has their website, um, audubon.org and the American Bird Conservancy, which is abcbirds.org. Um, those are really great websites to learn more about bird conservation um, and research that's going on. There's lots of inter interesting stories that come out of the Facebook group because um, we couldn't have done some of the things that happened wouldn't have happened 10 years ago without social media and without, you know, phone cameras. So we'll get situations where somebody snaps a picture of a bird at their feeder and they don't know what it is and they post it on to the Facebook group and then maybe they're not plugged in to um, 
you know, the more formal network of bird watchers. They don't know anybody else who's a bird watcher, but they Google Iowa bird watching and they find us and they post a picture and it'll be a bird like a painted bunting or a western tanager. These are birds that don't breed here and that are from, you know, the southeastern United States in the case of the painted bunting or the west coast in the case of the western tanager, for instance. And they'll say, this bird's at my feeder, what is it? And everyone's like, whoa, you know, <laughs> you just found a, a bird that everyone who's really excited about birds in the state is gonna wanna come to, to ring your yard with bird, you know, binoculars and cameras and try to see this bird when it comes back to your feeder. Um, and that can be, <laughs> That can be a really exciting moment that, you know, we find birds uh, because of that, that, that are, would have been getting missed 10 years ago. Someone would have just been like, oh, I had this bird and it had blue and red and green and yellow on it. And I didn't know what it was. And there was nothing like it in my Iowa bird book. Birding in general is, is just a, such a great way to be involved in being outdoors. And, you know, with all the challenges that we're facing everywhere, uh, with, uh, with in the natural environment, that uh, it's a way to get involved with that. And the, um, you know, I grew up obviously with bird books. I mean, we, everything was on paper and that. But uh, now, you know, with your, my, my smartphone, I can look up anything. You know, it's almost as good as, as in a book. And there's apps now that you can say, okay, here's what I think I saw, or here's what I'm seeing, what are the possibilities, and even with bird songs they're doing that now so uh, it's making it much easier to improve your birding skills if you want to. Birders have a variety of, of interests and, and passions so some birders are really into photography and capturing every species that they see through photos. Some birders are more interested in the feeder birds and what comes to their feeder and watching their behavior. Some birders are listers where they um, they have specific lists of either they have a life list, like how many species have I seen in my life? They have a state list, how many species have I seen in the state? Some people have county lists or backyard bird lists. And it all just depends on um, you and what, what excites you and what drives you to continue to bird. For some reason, water stayed open at the south end of Sweet Marsh this winter, most days. And so there was a great blue heron there that spent the winter there fishing. And normally they go quite a bit further south but when you make enough trips there, you, you watch it, you take pictures, and, and you wonder what crazy thing might happen next. And usually when you see it pull a fish out of the water, it's maybe six inches long, and, and it swallows it right away. But this one particular afternoon, when it came up out of the water, it came up with an over two foot long northern pike. It was truly incredible. I was glad that I kept snapping pictures instead of looking at my viewfinder screen to see if I got any nice pictures. And to watch that for about six minutes um, as it got itself out of the water with that fish and went through figuring out how it was going to try and swallow it and finally get the job done. And then by the time the episode was all over with from a really elongated neck to right back down to normal and it got it down. It didn't look like it was very comfortable in the process, <laughs> but it, it got the job done. And that truly, that was a, probably the biggest bird wow moment I had. Creating a friendly yard for birds can be really enjoyable for you as the viewer um, and can be really beneficial to the birds themselves. So um, you can feed all year round if you'd like. Maybe this, the suite of foods that you feed might change during the year. So um, in the winter, I personally feed suet and um, sunflower seeds, and that keeps most of the, the year-round birds happy. In the summer, I switch over and I, I keep those things, but I add um, hummingbird nectar feeders, as well as um, orange slices for the Orioles. There's a variety of foods that we can use. We can also plant native plants, which provide native fruits or native seeds um, that the birds would naturally be eating. And, and creating those habitats in your backyard where you have native plants um, and a variety of types of plants and, and a variety of layers of, of vegetation out there really will increase the number of birds that use your yard and find it useful and potentially will nest in your yard or just come and forage there. I put the work into the yard and I can sit here any day that I want and watch the hummingbirds come and go. I go to Chicago Bottoms a fair amount uh, 
Purple Martin Lake on the south side of Des Moines, close to Walnut Woods. And then I've got several areas along the river that aren't, you know, I mean, there's public access, but they're kind of nondescript, but I've been there and seen things enough there that I know. I'm one of these type of photographers. I don't really chase things. I'll go and set up my little tripod chair. I might sit there for three hours. If something comes along interesting, I, I get a picture. If something doesn't come along, well, I've got to sit out for three hours in my chair outdoors. So hummingbirds are, are probably my number one uh, photographic endeavor, but a very close second would be raptors of any sort. And then after that, I like pretty much all birds in general. Uh, we get a fair amount of orioles here right now, uh, catbirds, quite a few different. We even have some warblers stop by here once in a while. So much of what's going on with uh, bird watchers and birders now is photography. That's a big thing. A lot of people are just love to take pictures of birds. And so that's really, I think that's sparked a lot of interest. I have a, a yard list and a state list and a um, United States list. I'm not a, I don't jump all over the world like some <laughs> folks do, but yeah, it's interesting. Many people keep track of how many birds they've seen uh, generally or specifically in Iowa. And so when a new rare bird that doesn't show up in Iowa very often um, finally does, they like to go and try to find it to, and themselves and lay eyes upon it so that they can say they've seen it here in Iowa. I have a pretty big life list. I don't know how many species exactly is on it. Um, I'm originally from Minnesota. I grew up birding there. Uh, I went to school in Oregon and then did graduate work in New York. So I added a lot of different birds on two ends of the country. And while I was in graduate school for ornithology, I went to Costa Rica. And I got to add something like 400 bird species from Costa Rica. So um, I've seen birds, I've seen a lot of birds, um, some of them not even in the United States, even though they're common in certain parts of the United States, mostly because I've traveled to new places because the birds in California are very different than the birds on the East Coast, which are very different than the birds in Texas, which are very different than the birds in Northern Minnesota. Um, so if you get to a few of those different places in the country, you're gonna add, step out of the airplane and most of the birds are gonna be different. And then if you manage to travel overseas, it's even better from a birding perspective because you, everything's new. I personally have a list from my office, you know, or a feeder list out of my office. So I keep track of, of who's around the office. Um, I also have a backyard bird list um, and I have a state list and, and things like that. But the listing is, is really a personal preference, but sometimes it can get kind of competitive among friends. Usually it's a friendly competition, luckily. Um, so for example, my, my, my brother and my mom are also birders, and every year we have a list to see who can get the most birds in a year. We have a little competition, um, and we're so nerdy about it that my mom made a trophy and everything. Mm. So <laughs> we, we go all out, but um, we just keep track of our yearly list, and then we compare, and at the end, um, we get a trophy for a year, and it's really just in good fun and, and a good way to stay connected with, with, my, with my family that's in different states and just saying, you know, up on, what bird did you see today, and that sort of thing. So. Um, there's a lot of different levels of, of competitiveness or listing and, and how people embrace birds. And that's what's so cool about it because there's such variety um, in, the, in the same passion. Bird, song, bird sound is a very important part if, if you want to improve your birding skills because you hear, eight, you know, I can identify probably 80% of your birds are through song as opposed to visual. Or, and you know, once you hear them, you can start looking for them, obviously. Um, so like, that's a red-bellied woodpecker. And then there's a great crested flycatcher calling. So anyway, uh, and like I said, you know, one thing about bird watching, birding, is you can put as much effort into it as you want. You can learn as much as you want. So uh, a lot of folks just, with their feeders, you know, are, are feeder watchers and you don't need, you know, obviously the more you know, the more you can get out of it, but it's 
it's not a requirement and uh, I don't my experience here in Iowa anyway it's not a it's not a snobbish endeavor at all you know um, any all levels are welcome it's a really easy sort of recreational we could call it a sport recreational sport to get into um, I'd also recommend you know in terms of getting started plug into the group start asking questions but just go out and find a little patch of habitat and see if you can't start laying eyes on some birds and making some guesses at identification take advantage of of the, the Facebook groups and see what each other is doing and, and uh, a lot of people you know ask about identifications and and uh, want help on that and most everybody's very happy to help with that they make some wonderful mobile apps if people have smartphones or iPads that sort of thing that uh, you can you can take your pictures and plug them right into the app and it'll identify it for you and uh, just learn from each other that's how I did it if you want to get more interested in birding we say you know learn the common stuff because other birds sound like robins well if you don't know what a, if you don't know a robin well you're always going to be confused if you will so it's kind of same like cardinals you know they have a lot of different songs if, 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 study your common birds start with that get familiar with them and then you can build off of that put out a bird feeder. The summer is an interesting time to feed birds because most birds are feeding babies and they're looking for insects, but you can still put out seed and some birds will find it. And that'll get you some birds that you, good close up looks of stuff, uh, you know, that you might not otherwise get easy looks at as you're learning to use binoculars. You just focus on that feeder and then you set your binoculars down. And when a bird shows up, you pick the binoculars up again and everything's ready to go. I think through some of the people I've met, especially this winter, when we went down to see the saw wet owl and, and a couple of other uh, sightings, we talked to each other about how did you get that shot? What did you do? And, and even if you don't have the same exact camera equipment, um, you, can, you can learn from each other. So that, that's been a real plus. You know, each of our own appreciation for what the other is doing, you know, recognizing the, the skill and, and the, the uh, wonderful captures and finds that, that some people get uh, and you communicate with each other and, and yeah, I think you, you get to be online friends for sure, no question about it. And I'm relatively new to it. Some of these people have been doing it for 10, 15 years and so they, they know each other a lot better, of course. And some of the people I met in person down in Waterloo this winter, yeah, we communicate with each other and, and uh, wanna go see what each other has done and when we get together, we, it's kind of like having a little coffee group almost. You just sit and visit. Sometimes you're not so busy taking pictures, but just talking. Then you just got to start looking, and it, the more you look, the more you'll realize that there's a lot more birds out there than what, than what you see there. And I just got to the point I would see something that I didn't know what it was. I'd take a picture of it, and then I would go to one of my books, and look up and see what it was and over time you just gain a little bit of knowledge as the I mean I'm still stumped sometimes when I see something and I have to look it up but it's less frequent now. A lot of people when they're starting out sounds are helpful to clue you in that there's a bird there but you might not know what it is and so I encourage you to track down a sound and get eyeballs on it and then identify the species visually and then connect the sound with what you're looking at and that'll help you learn the sounds and the birds by visual identification. Keep your eyes open. That I mean, honestly, that's how it's, when it comes to nature and nature, wildlife photography, it's all about opening your eyes to what goes on around you. I mean, it's a, uh, I know one thing that I do a lot, especially during, I might have mentioned that this is warbler season and I'll go sit in a spot, warblers are very skittish and they move constantly. So I look for motion, not even really necessarily looking for a bird in particular, but I'll look for motion in, in the trees, in the limbs, especially down by water. And that's usually when I'll, when I'll spot them. So. My best advice for anybody taking up wildlife photography is just to keep your eyes open. I mean, there's things happening all around us all the time that unless you're really kind of looking for it, you might not see. Iowa Ornithologist Union has a list of 
birding locations that are really top-notch birding spots um, for every county. And so on their website, you can easily find good places to start in your local area. And then eBird has locations that have been flagged as hotspots because of the diversity of birds and because of the number of people that go birding there. And so both of those resources can point you to local parks that might have a, a good diversity of birds. Um, and it also tells you a bit about what types of birds are seen there. So if you're targeting a specific species or if you wanna focus on ducks today or whatever it is, you can find locations that will suit your need for that. Um, but a lot of places like local parks or, or your backyard have a lot of those birds. They just aren't birded the same way because it's not a destination. And so um, you can see birds anywhere, which is why they're so amazing. Um, you know, from the city park to, uh, you know, on a skyscraper, peregrine falcons will nest. You know, so birds are everywhere and uh, we just need to take the time to listen and, and watch for them. And you'll be amazed at what you can find.